please welcome uh, Joseph Marks and our panelists. I don't think there's going to be, it's a panel, so I don't think they're going to, yeah. Otherwise, it's like right in their eyes. It is, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, four panels plus one. Who is this? Uh, absolutely. Have you spoken to the moderator? Uh, is this for the next panel? Yes. The one coming up right now. Okay. Wait, who are you seven minutes for? Yeah. I don't see that person on this list. Are you sure that's the right, you're here at the right time? I'll stand. Rita, Wayne, Trevor, and Alex. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Um, maybe Jacqueline. Yep. What's up? He's supposed to be subbing in for a panelist. Look, it's, it's, not, it's Rita. Oh. And actually, while we set up, I was remiss. I'm supposed to announce we have a new panel that will be held at 6 p.m. Uh, let me pull up the name. So at 6 p.m. we'll also we'll have a new panel that's called The Devil Went Down to Georgia, Did He Steal Souls, uh, which is the Georgia's electronic voting saga. It's basically an update on the case down in Georgia right now. So it's going to be a really interesting panel. I, I encourage you all to join us with, on it. Joseph, I introduced... Oh, watch out for you. Just sent on a pen. Yeah. Uh, I just introduced you while you were coming up here. Maybe it was a little premature. But I didn't introduce your panels, so I left okay. that to you. Otherwise, I'd be right, up for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Are you all done? Yeah, I'm all done. So oh. it's all yours now. Hello. Oh, so it uh, looks like people are still coming in. I'm Joe Marks, uh, cybersecurity reporter for the Washington Post, and I write the Cybersecurity 202. And we have the stage for a really long time today. So what we're doing is splitting this up into three sections. We have on stage right now some government folks. Um, we're going to talk maybe 25 minutes, take a little break. We're going to bring up some industry folks, talk 25 minutes, take a break, and then. Hello? This good? Okay. Um, we're going to talk with industry folks for 25 minutes take a little break and then come back with everyone and I'm not sure how we'll make the seats work and we'll talk a little bit more with everyone and hopefully that will be primarily audience questions. So be prepared to ask all the questions you can. So uh, we have not met in person today yet so I'm going to start naming names <laughs> and then raise your hand. Uh, we have Alex Joves who is regional director uh, for the Cybersecurity Information Security Administration at DHS covering a chunk of the Midwest. We have Rita Gass, Gass uh, Chief Information Officer for the California Secretary of State's Office. We have Wayne Thorley, uh, Deputy, Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Elections right here in Nevada. And Trevor Timmons, uh, for, uh, the CIO of the Colorado, Colorado Secretary of State's Office. So the big thing we wanted to talk about all throughout today and especially in this panel is are we ready for 2020. And so I thought it would be good to start by getting a feel for the room. So how many people here by show of hands think that just in terms of the security of the ballots themselves, not the deep fakes, not the bots and everything else and the influence operations, think that 2020 will be more secure than 2016? Okay. <laughs> I see one of these. Uh, how many think it will not be significantly more secure? Okay, we're going 50-50 in this room. Okay, and then second question, and again, we're just talking about the security of the ballot itself. Uh, how many believe it will be as secure as it needs to be to have high confidence in the outcome in 2020? <laughs> the panel and the room are divided. <laughs> and how many think it will not be as secure as it needs to be? Did we, did we have high confidence all throughout the panel here? I didn't look over. Okay. So, 
Um, let's start with, because you have sort of countrywide, but certainly uh, a larger remit, several states. Um, Alex, tell me why it will be as secure as it needs to be, and tell me about what you've been doing since 2016. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Okay. So you know, I'll talk about uh, the work that we've done again since 2016 at DHS now CISA, right? So again, you you've heard, and if you were in the room uh, before me, you've heard both our NCATS team, you've heard uh, Katie Trimble from our uh, continuous uh, disclosure team, you've heard probably a, a, a lot of different CISA folks talking about some of our services there. So let me just highlight what we've done again since 2016 uh, when DHS named uh, election uh, the election sector critical infrastructure. So so number one, we really have put this into to three buckets. Uh, one, information sharing. So uh, we'll get more into specifics of that, but that is anywhere from, uh, one, the establishment of the EI ISAC, that's the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing Analysis Center. Sorry, that's a really long title, the EI ISAC. But essentially, think about that as your situation room, your 24-7 uh, threat uh, info uh, mitigation. And, and again, we have uh, you know states and locals uh, on that uh, information sharing. We also... Um, can ramp that up for election days and, and we're able to set up an election day situation room where again our state and local officials, again, who run elections, let me just start there first. Elections are run by state and local jurisdictions. We, the federal government, CISA in particular, are here to support the jurisdictions and help with our cybersecurity and physical security resources for that. So, so one again, information sharing, uh, that's just one part of that and, and really our, our state and local partners can talk more of that. Two, the technical assessments and their services. So you heard again the panel before us talking about the left of boom services, right? So these are the services, again, we do this across the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. So traditionally, right, I talk about the lifeline sectors, water, energy, transportation, communications. Uh, but now we're looking at election infrastructure as well. So those same technical assessments, you heard Jason talk about the left of boom ones. Those are those cyber hygiene, uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, cyber assessments, enterprise assessments that we can do on site, uh, all the way to that red team, the phishing campaigns. Uh, a lot of those resources, again, are now open to our uh, election partners. And then your right of boom, right? He talked about when you do have an incident, uh, we were able to bring in those government resources, what we call our hunt and incident response teams, to help um, them identify those and mitigate those threats. Again, supporting our state and local partners. So that's that technical assessment. And then the third uh, piece I'll talk about is just the training uh, and the outreach, right? So I've heard some questions here. Hey, how do you guys uh, get the information out? So, so one, we are out there uh, across the country, and again, I, I cover six states in the Midwest, getting um, both these services and this information out that's available, right? So I think, you know, the statistic now is that we've got 50 states involved. Uh, we have 1,800, or actually it's, it's 1,900 now, local jurisdictions, so it keeps going up, uh, involved uh, with our services. Uh, and again, that's both with the outreach of that, we do tabletop exercises. It's a national tabletop the vote, all the way to state-specific and county-specific exercises. So um, again, what I've seen it over the past uh, three years that I've been involved since 2016. Uh, now it's really robust. Uh, the, the other thing I'll, I'll talk about here um, is that's actually expanded as well, and I, that might be the other question you're going to get so as we go into 2020, that's expanded now to obviously at the state jurisdiction as much of the local jurisdictions, because again, we're talking about 8,800 local election jurisdictions uh, to get to, uh, but also to the private vendors. And, and then finally, uh, to again, uh, to candidates uh, on both at, of all parties. So we're working with, uh, I think that we're at a dozen presidential campaigns that have, uh, again, received the briefing about our services and, and again, can also take uh, those, including the RNC and the DNC. Yep. And so, uh, Rita, tell me about your work with the California Secretary of State's office. And um, to be clear, you don't cover voting machines, right? But you do cover all these back-end systems, which if you guys have been reading, uh, the Mueller report, the Senate Intelligence Committee report have been major targets. So can you tell us what you've been doing since 2016? So, yes, I'm the Chief Information Officer for the California Secretary of State. My role is to do uh, um, technology oversight for our infrastructure, data center, uh, endpoint um, support and security operations. Our election team is responsible for policy and um, working with the counties in running their, uh, their election systems. Our responsibility is more on the voter registration and websites and anything that support the Secretary of State, not just elections, but we also do business filings, archives, uh, political campaign um, 
reforms and all the other functions that belongs under the Secretary of State. So the, when we were raising our my when I was raising my hand that says that 2020 is much more secure than 2016, I'm talking about California. Since 2016, I've run five elections already since I started in June of uh, 2016, just right after the 2016. Um, uh, primary elect general elections and we have done so much between 2016 and now we have done so much in the difference we have created different programs the two programs was created just before the 2018 general um, midterm elections we have created two programs that is our um, election cybersecurity office that is probably one or one of the few or even the start of a uh, an office that is very specific on um, voter education, clerk, uh, county clerks and staff training, um, sharing of information with different partners such as MSISAC, federal partners, state and local government, as well as um, we also have a team of individuals that whose primary purpose is to um, monitor misinformation in uh, in the internet. So we created that that that. Um, office within three months. We got the budget, we created the office, and it was up and running for the 2018 elections. The second office that we have also created is an office of risk management. That office is probably one of the few California State Department that has a risk office, which is the information security officers are under, and it, it is very specific on information security. That risk office it was created uh, two months before the, the elections. So now that we have all these programs in place, we are in a better, better position. We also have implemented um, initiatives that is very specific on um, misinformation and disinformation campaign. So we uh, uh, created a website for one, a one-stop website for election uh, for voters to go to um, election information we created that within five days from planning to implementation now for you guys here in the private industry you would say well five days for a website that's normal but for government agency that is not normal typically <laughs> Typically, it is weeks or even months or even years. But we created things like this within five days. Also, we also created a um, the first uh, paid mo uh, social media campaign to combat misinformation. That was also created with probably less than three weeks. So within that time frame, we were able to implement this. And actually, as a CIO for Secretary of State, we have a very big challenge with any IT programs or uh, IT initiatives. When we pre uh, when we do our planning with elections, things doesn't stop. We have to finish everything that we, our initiative is for elections. So, for example, if you are implementing a tax filing system or something like that, you can say, "Oh, okay, we did, we missed our deadline. We can redo. It, we can postpone it, or maybe implement it the next time." With elections, when you once you plan it for that. For that election, you have to finish it. We have to be able to finish it. So that's that's part of our challenge. But but we are in a better position now because we have implemented a bunch and a lot of successful uh, initiatives that that went well in the 2018 election. Great. So uh, Wayne and Trevor, please tell me what you've done since 2016 to make elections more secure. But also, Rita had an interesting caveat. Are you speaking when you said more secure? Are you speaking for your states or countrywide? I'm just speaking. I'm not sure what other states are doing, but I'm sure, like with Trevor here, he's pretty much in a, in a, in a better position too. Um, so. uh, sure. Uh, thank you. And again, thanks for the 202. Love it. Uh, if you're an election official, whether you're a tech person or an election official, uh, subscribe to that. They're fabulous. Sorry. They're fabulous. Um, so I want to talk about a couple things. So we have done uh, in Colorado, uh, it, again, I'll contrast uh, 2016 to 2018 to 2020. It's really an evolution. I mean, 2016, uh, some folks in uh, summer 2016, when DHS and the FBI started sending out information about some of the, uh, some of the activity that they had seen, um, some people were uh, caught unawares, right? Uh, I think many members of the public were probably caught unawares, you know, with that information that, oh my goodness, stuff is happening. Um, you know, the reality is in most of the election offices in terms of managing state voter registration databases and election night reporting systems and that, 
in many states there, there has been awareness of the risks of those. And comparing where we were in 2016, that's before the critical infrastructure designation of election systems. And so that's why I raised my hand. Are we better off, are, are we in a better position approaching 2020 than we were in 2016? Absolutely. Um, uh, today, uh, in our state, I think many states, maybe all states, uh, we've got a pretty good relationship with our DHS region staff and with DHS headquarters. Um, you know, they, they won't tell you, the DHS folks that were up here earlier, they won't tell you who has done a risk and vulnerability assessment, who has brought in that hunt team to look for evidence of compromise that is latent, that is in a system, ready to be uh, exercised. Um, they, they won't do that because uh, it's victim notification. They want to keep that information private so that they can encourage other people to take advantage of those services without fear that it's going to get out and say, well, what did they find? You know, what did they see? And, uh, but Colorado, we've done that. Um, the nine services that he was talking about in terms of DHS and the AI, and the, working with the EI ISAC in terms of adding those services to your portfolio to secure those systems, um, we've done those. And we're continuing to do those because this is, this is something that is never going to end. We are never, we are never going to be able to say we're done, right? Oh, solve security, don't worry about it. Um, some of the other things we do is really reaching out to those local election officials. Um, incident response planning and training. Um, the, uh, I'll give credit to the folks at the Belfer Center out of Harvard. Um, they actually reached out to election officials both on the technology side and the kind of the business process and policy side um, to develop uh, kind of a TTX, a tabletop exercise in a box. Okay, so they brought, uh, the, in the second iteration of that, they brought in over a hundred election officials from across the country to actually do this role playing of a tabletop exercise to think about the things that could happen and how you would respond to them. Okay. Uh, uh, DHS, uh, this summer they did the second of the annual exercises where they brought in local and state and federal partners uh, uh, on the government side and on the private sector side to actually participate in these exercises. You know what? It is fabulous to have a clerk and recorder from a small county, you know, uh, uh, respond to a question about, hey, so one of your candidates just posted something on Twitter alleging that there's some abuse of the election system, you know, going on. How do you respond? And, and it's, no, it's even better because when you do this in a role-playing exercise, you will have a camera and a microphone in front of this local election official. Um, we brought in technical people, cybersecurity people, elections policy people, public information officers from local governments to participate in this role-playing exercise. We had a statewide exercise in Colorado in September uh, of last year, uh, two years ago, and uh, just to prepare for what could happen. We'll be doing it again in January because there's turnover at, the, at that local level. Um, being aware of the risks that are out there and understanding what resources are available to react and respond when something does happen, I mean, that's, that's part of the battle. It's not all of the battle, but that's part of the battle. Um, so, uh, I just want to rush through because we're running a little short on time. Go ahead, sir. Um, so uh, I, too, am very confident that uh, specifically for the state of Nevada, and welcome everybody to Nevada and Las Vegas, my hometown, glad you all could be here. Um, <laughs> that the 2020 election uh, will be uh, much more secure than the 2016 election. And, you know, I can confidently speak for the rest of my colleagues in other states, too, because uh, we've been uh, at uh, conferences, other trainings, the national TTX, and I know my colleagues in other states uh, that administer elections are taking the, uh, the threat uh, to elections very seriously, and I've, I've taken a lot of steps forward in that regard. Um, so while I'm extremely confident that for Nevada the answer to that question is yes, I'm really confident, maybe not to the extremely confident level, but really confident the answer is yes uh, for other states too because I know that my colleagues in other states are, are taking this issue uh, seriously. Um, you know, my role in Nevada as, as Deputy Secretary of State is to, you know, I oversee the administration of all elections in the state of Nevada from federal elections down to local elections. Uh, I also advise the Secretary on matters of policy and law. Um, I'm probably the only non, I'm the non, I think I'm the only non-tech person on this panel. Uh, my background's in economics. I'm, I'm a numbers person, uh, but um, so it's 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 been a, it's been a, uh, a lot of an education campaign uh, surrounding this issue, uh, both for people in the state level and also getting it down to the to the local lever, level. Uh, in in here in Nevada and Clark County, uh, right here where we are at, 
Uh, it's one of the largest voting jurisdictions in the country. Uh, we have over a million uh, registered voters, and it's like in the top 15 uh, largest counties uh, in the country. We also, on the other end of the spectrum, have Esmeralda County, which is like three hours northwest of here if you want to get on the, uh, the 95 and start heading. Uh, north, and there's like 200 registered voters there, and there's more cows than people. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's a huge difference between the amount of resources that are available for the counties and the uh, both uh, financial resources, but human resources too. Uh, so the technical expertise, uh, some of the counties uh, contract out their, their IT support services because they just don't have anybody in the county to do that. So. so Oh, can I jump in quick? Yeah. So I want to draw a couple of different threads together here. So um, as Wayne was just talking about, uh, there's uh, a varying amount of resources that different counties have. Um, you all said you're very confident in your own states, you know, and yet Politico had a report uh, a couple of weeks ago looking at counties in states that did not have paper ballots in 2016, found 150 they're still going to be using non-paper ballots in 2020. A uh, separate report out of Motherboard found, I think, three, three dozen situations in which uh, voting machines were connected to the Internet. That should not be. Um, none of them were in California. None of the, the paper states were in California, Nevada, uh, or Colorado. Um, so one, do we have the wrong voting officials up here? <laughs> and two, uh, what needs to be done about this? Uh, um, Senator Wyden, when, he's here, when he was here yesterday, left by uh, urging everyone to go call your member of Congress, demand election security legislation, demand mandates and more money for elections. Is that what we need? What's going to, why should people have confidence in the entirety of the voting system, not just these three high performing states? So I'll take, I'll take a stab at that first. Um, Election officials uh, across the country, you know, we're not waiting for Congress to take action on the issue of election security. Uh, we're moving forward. Uh, if we're going to wait for Congress, we could be waiting here all, you know, you know, 20 years or more before Congress takes action on this. Um, so we don't have our heads in the sand and we don't feel like we're uh, stuck uh, and not being able to move forward without permission or some sort of action from Congress. Uh, in Nevada, we've been very proactive in reaching out to our state legislature and uh, securing funding, but also getting laws passed to enhance the security of elections in Nevada. Uh, just uh, this last legislative session that adjourned just in June of this year, uh, we were able to get legislation passed that mandates risk, post, uh, risk limiting audits, which is a type of post-election audit, uh, so that we can have a high degree of confidence that the, uh, the reported uh, outcome uh, the elections is accurate. Uh, so we're going to start working on that. Uh, we have mandatory um, information security training for all of our county election officials now, thanks to legislation that was adopted, uh, because we're seeing those things uh, that CISA mentioned earlier, these, these common um, issues popping up as we go out and meet with the counties. And one of those is, is uh, um, phishing emails. And so we're running a phishing uh, email campaign right now in our state uh, sending out fake fish, phishing emails and then seeing who clicks on the links in there. And if they do, then, you know, they get the little call from our office saying, hey, you got to take this uh, remediation training. Uh, so we're doing that. And do you need more federal money? I'm not going to say no to federal money. <laughs> um, you know, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, so we would absolutely love more federal money. Uh, but we've been, we've been very um, resourceful uh, through our state division of emergency management, which gets a grant from FEMA every year, Homeland Security grant. They subgrant it out to state entities. Uh, we've gotten a quarter of a million dollars uh, through that program over the last two uh, years uh, to enhance the security of our voter registration uh, database. Um, so we're not waiting around for Congress uh, to, to get their act together. Anyone else want to take a quick stab at whether we should be more concerned about the states and counties not represented here? Uh, I think the answer is yes, we should. Okay, um, uh, I've got a little, a little different perspective on this. Okay, so states and local governments, uh, they need to stand up to their responsibilities to like do the right thing, take the right approaches, look at best practices and implement them. Okay, um, but, uh, and I do favor uh, more federal funding. There are some states that have paperless voting machines and it's a problem and it's, it takes money, it takes training, it takes resourcing to actually address that problem. 
Um, what I what I fear is that uh, with an influx of federal money, that uh, there will be a perception that a one-time infusion to address today's problems would be enough, and it will not. Uh, this is this is something that we are in for. Uh, you know, you could say the long haul. Uh, I can say as long as I'm a voter, and and I think we need to look at it that way and look at it as a national mission. You know, at the federal, at the state, at the local level, uh, and at the community level to actually address that. So I, I just want to jump ahead to another question because we're running short on time here. So we are here at DEFCON. Uh, Voting Village uh, last year uh, found vulnerabilities in numerous systems and there was some uh, conflict with election administrators. The National Association of Secretaries of State criticized it for Call, uh, for not having realistic conditions, called it a pseudo environment which in no way replicates state election systems, networks, or physical security, said it misrepresented the actual security of the election. Um, is that still true? Are things getting better this time? What's the relationship like between you guys and these guys? Uh, I think it is better. I think if you look around the conference this year, you'll see more elected officials, you'll see more geeks like me who support those processes uh, than you've seen in years past. And I expect that to continue to grow. I mean, I think having the conversation, actually establishing the relationship and the trust amongst the partners, I mean, we need to do that before we can all get together and start to trustfully, purposefully move together and address some of those issues. I mean, we need to engage. That, that's why I'm here. I'll agree with that. Um, it took us a while to build this relationship of trust with DHS when they first started reaching out to us in 2016. Uh, I remember getting a phone call from someone at DHS and being like, who are you? And it's like, well, I, and, they, and they actually had called the governor's office first. And they, so on their side, they weren't sure who administered elections. And, and so it took a while to build that trust and, and to speak each other's language. And I, I think we're working on that here, too, with the hacker community, uh, where we're building that relationship of trust. Uh, uh, Trevor's exactly right. There are more uh, people that work in elections here than there has been in the past two uh, DEF CON conferences. I think that will continue to grow. And with that will come that, that, that trust as we learn each other's language and uh, learn what your motivations are and then you all learn uh, what our constraints are, um, then I think we can really have a productive relationship. So Rita and Alex, uh, are these, are we working with realistic conditions now and are our hackers and election administrators speaking the same language or are there still a gulf? Well, there's always going to be, you know, the, for California, we have a very complex, it's not a single um, simple centralized event. It is a very complex of multiple, uh, an ecosystem of multiple technologies and processes, including non digital. So it's important that it, people understand how election processes is, are working. It's not a one size fits all. Every county is different, every state is different. So when they say, hey, we, someone gets scanned, everybody should first do their due diligence and providing the right information because when at first when DHS says hey California you get scanned of course everybody gets scanned by the way but you know you Russian gets scanned your network it wasn't even our network that we were, they were referring to meaning the Secretary of State network so that was the first time in, in 2016 but it, the, the relationship has gotten better a lot better like the Secretary of said yesterday and, and I'll just wrap it up actually more as an answer to the, your last two questions. So, so one, you know, it very much, and what we found, and as I started, again, states and local jurisdictions run elections. They make, um, again, uh, the rule, when we have the recommendations, it's up to them and their legislatures to implement that. And again, we obviously have our federal government resources that are available to support that and enhance that. I will tell you that that's not the only uh, solution though, right? And that's why we're here. That's why every year it's growing. Uh, the partnership part of that is so key. So a couple of the states, uh, again, um, that you may have mentioned in your reports, again, we're, we're trying to, one, get the, uh, both the information out there that there's a threat here, right? So, so that's better than it was. Uh, second, we're trying to build resiliency measures that's there, right? So again, if it's just paper, um, paperless ballots right now, what is the resiliency measures that can be set, you know, short of the funding, whether you get that through your state legislature or not? And then again, for mitigation and incident responses, again, state and local jurisdictions are doing what they need to do to, uh, uh, again, address these threats. Now, it's not just the federal 
federal government that's providing this. You're getting this from third-party vendors, from industry. Uh, again, I, I, state and local jurisdictions are working directly with that to, to fulfill um, a lot of their needs. They're also uh, working, again, with, with the community here um, to get those needs set. So it really is, I mean, I, I think it's important to emphasize it's a partnership. And I know they say it's a whole of government effort. It's a whole of election sector effort uh, on that. So that's really grown. Um, thank you very much, folks. We're running short, so we'll take a little break, and we'll be back with some folks from industry. All right, we're back, if everyone's ready. So here we have public sector folks. Uh, we're starting with a little, sorry. It's Saturday. It's okay. Uh, starting with uh, Alyssa Starzak, uh, head of policy at Cloudflare. Uh, we also have uh, Josh Benelow, senior cryptographer at Microsoft Research, and Jay Kaplan, co founder and CEO of Cyanac. Um, all of these guys are doing something, all these companies are doing something to help secure elections. Um, I wanted to start, though, by just we'll do, put them on the spot and do the show of hands again. Are, do you agree, will we be secure enough, as secure as we need to be, to be highly confident in the results of the 2020 election? Okay. <laughs> They're more with the crowd. Okay. Um, Alyssa, tell me what Cloudflare is doing. We're shooting for like one minute. So if you don't know us, uh, we are a security and performance company. Uh, we provide uh, security to uh, websites and anything connected to the internet. Uh, we actually have a set of free services that's available to state and local election uh, officials. And uh, lots of states use us. I think uh, we launched in December of 2017. Um, and th the time of the last election, we had more than half of the states had some jurisdiction on us. Josh? It's going to be hard to be that quick. Um, I, I would love to be able to tell you I've got a way of securing elections and we're done. Great. I don't know how to do that for even a simple application, and voting is not a simple application. Secret ballot voting is even a harder application, and with the challenges that we have, we heard about, what is it, Miranda County, uh, you said, in, in Nevada with 200 voters, being able to withstand an attack from a, a nation state in Russia, I, I don't think it's reasonable for us to be able to claim we have any hope of being able to actually secure an election system. The one thing we actually can do is we can enable uh, detectability of tampering of any kind, any and all tampering in an election system. And I'm not just talking about internal tampering, external tampering, or not just internal, even tampering that hasn't been dreamed of yet is all detectable by technology that we can build today. And that's what Microsoft is working with partners to deploy uh, to, um, technology that enables ta uh, any tampering to be detected. And I'd be happy to talk more about how, but I don't have an opportunity to do it, but it's going to be <laughs> open, freely available, open source. Anybody can use it. We're working with vendors. We, we really want to get it out there. Um, so, for those of you not familiar with Synac, um, we are a platform that enables big enterprises and government institutions to engage with a crowdsourced community of white hat hackers um, on a very, in a very controlled and trusted environment. Um, and back in late 2017, we announced an initiative where we were going to allocate a million dollars towards um, free services for any state or local entity that wanted to engage in Synax services or products, um, specifically related to anything that can be accessed remotely. We weren't coming on site, but for voter registration systems, for any voting machines that we can't connect to remotely, and for any of the um, reporting interfaces, we were going to perform testing for free. This has been incredibly challenging because offering something for free is actually a lot harder than offering something that people pay for, as we realized pretty quickly. Um, and we can talk about uh, what some of those challenges were. Um, we are engaged with, with several different um, states at this point uh, and some local entities and are seeing some great results, um, but, but not nearly as much of a pickup as we had anticipated. So it's, uh, speak about that, please. And, and you got, other people can jump in, too. But is, how tough is it for a company that has a product that it believes can help make elections more secure to actually get that in place at the state and local level, and why? 
So I think one of the challenges that we experienced was that there are just so many different organizations involved in every single one of these disparate systems. And so while, yeah, we can go engage with the Secretary of State's office, the reality is they're utilizing a, a number of different vendors for their voter registration systems, for the voting machines, um, and, and pretty much you know, that, that entire flow from, from initial registration all the way to, to results. And so our challenge was, okay, who is the right person or company or entity to actually go to to offer our services for free because th they sometimes, they're just like the connective tissue. Um, and so we, uh, we, we just had a lot, of, a lot of challenges figuring that piece out. Um, but once we started to realize that like if we got the if, the, if we actually got the the SOS of, of a certain state, um, or we got even a, a local um, municipality to engage on a paid basis, there it was just a lot easier to kind of once you're going through that contracting process to engage with the right party. So we actually now work with one of the largest cities in in, in the country um, on a project, and we've seen pretty amazing results. Results that actually are now. Um, forcing them to switch to paper ballots ahead of the 2020 election. So, um, and you know, we'd love to talk more about kind of paper versus not and some of that uptake, but. Thanks. So yes, it's, it's an incredible challenge to, to get things out there. Um, we are um, partnering with most of the, uh, the large election vendors, most of the small election vendors have, have agreed to partner in this project. It's called Election Guard. Um, just to be clear, Microsoft has no intention of building and deploying election systems. It would be a bad idea. We don't want to do that. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're building this open source toolkit that we're sharing with, with vendors and showing them how to use it. Um, and there's been a lot of uptake and a lot of interest there. So I'm, I'm very encouraged and optimistic mystic that um, that will happen. The next step is partnering with jurisdictions, mm -hmm. getting some pilots going, getting some adoption, getting some trial. Um, and one of the big hurdles there is regulatory. Um, the uh, uh, federal regulations, even though they're voluntary, um, most states adopt them in, in some form, which is a good thing, but um, they're not very flexible. And what we're doing is something that's very different, very new, very um, unusual and, and doesn't fit in with the, the current process. What, what we're doing is a process which enables validation of actual elections. And the regulatory process is for validation of election equipment. And it's like a round peg and square hole trying to say, well, but you don't need to check this because it's externally validated. Do, do the we, regulations do, do it anyway. Do we need to move beyond the um, voluntary voting system guidelines, which turn into regulations at state? Is that not agile enough for? It's certainly not agile, agile enough. It is very valuable. So I don't want to say we should, we should abandon it anyway. It, it has its role. But um, especially with a system like this, where external verifiability of an election is possible, um, you don't need to verify the equipment in which the election is run to verify the accuracy of an election. Then it should, should change the way the standards are written so that standards can concentrate more on some of the things like, you know, um, are the, uh, is the font large enough? Is, the le is there enough contrast? Some, some of the basics we need to get to and, and some, some basic security things that need to be there. The standards are very good at checklist things and checklist things are not good at security. Uh, Alyssa, do you disagree? No, I don't disagree. I, th I think that there are different issues, though, um, and I think that we should talk about them differently because I think I, I think what that is about is about wholesale change in how we deal with elections. And so maybe it's not surprising that there's some pretty significant regulatory challenges. I think that we have a separate problem, which I think Jay alluded to, which is that we have an incredibly uh, disparate election system, which is great. It's decentralized. That's good from a from a from a potential uh, problem standpoint. It makes it much harder to, to hack. Um, it's uh, but, but it's also a challenge to the extent that you're talking about services that are potentially available. It's hard to connect with everybody. Um, and frankly, uh, from the private industry side, uh, you know, we're, we're offering the service from our standpoint um, as a free service, as a corporate social responsibility project. But people don't believe it because people are generally skeptical. And, and that's a really hard place to be too um, because every time you come in, you know, we're, 
it's it's part of a social responsibility team. It's not a big team. Um, and they're like, well, you should you should engage with every single person first, and then when you get to know them, then maybe they'll adopt your services. And when you're talking about the the number of election jurisdictions in the United States, that's not feasible. Uh, and it's it's hard to explain that from a private industry side, um, but it's true. And so I think in some ways we do need to think about ways where people are aware of what services are available for them uh, in the short term of things that they, they have gaps for now. Uh, they can assess what tools they need. That's, that's the role of election officials. That's the role of the public sector. Um, but the private sector can help fill those gaps as necessary. So, Alyssa, if you could do two things today, be uh, national election czar, change two things to make 2020 more secure, what would they be? You know, I actually think a lot, the reason I raised my hand to your first question, uh -huh. but maybe not your last question, is because I think a lot of things have been done. I think CISA has done a, a phenomenal job of trying to think through things. I think the Belfer Center really went through case by case and tried to look at vulnerabilities. And I think that they, um, if you look at some of the things that they did, um, they actually tried to, to make the assessment step by step of what should you do and where are your gaps. I think that the thing that we haven't quite done yet is the actual assessment against those products. And that's Hard because again, that's resource resource specific or resource intensive, um, and we don't necessarily have the resources to do it. Um, but I think what you want is every election jurisdiction to meet those criteria. Mm -hmm. Which, which sounds like an answer, right? It sounds like some of the mandates we've been talking about in legislation. You have to have paper ballots. You have to have post-election audits. Are those good candidates? Definitely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Josh, two so, things? Yeah, so the, the, those are easy for me because it's all about post-election auditing. So um, the, this um, public verifiable technology that I'm talking about, it's called end-to-end -end verifiability, should be done everywhere. Risk-limiting auditing should be done every contest, every election. They complement each other beautifully. We should do both in every single election. I think we have more of a, a, a we don't, we, I don't think security is actually the problem in, in, in the election, in election security. I think it's actually confidence, voter confidence uh, more than anything. And I think having, being like instilling that confidence in our, in, in those who are voting, uh, we're just doing, we're not doing a great job at it. Should be justified. Of course, of course, <laughs> it should be justified. Um, and so, you know, if there's something I could do uh, very quickly, I would basically force every single uh, technology environment end to end, whether it's a voting system, whether it's a registration system, uh, whether it's you know reporting the results, and, and open it up to on a vulnerability disclosure program, and allow every hacker in the world to try to find every vulnerability out there. It's the only way we can do it. I mean, we're, we're not going to be able to uh, you know sign enough contracts to get all of this done, especially in time for 2020. But there is an amazing community of hackers out there. Look at everyone at DEF CON who are, who are patriotic, who want to provide help and assistance um, and want to instill that confidence to those who, who don't understand cybersecurity. Um, and I think it's, it's something that's, that, that's doable. Um, I think it's hard, but uh, getting everyone on board. But if there was appropriate legislation in place, I think we, we could make it happen. So on that confidence question, you know, moving back to the 2018 Voting Village report, and uh, the National Association of Tech Secretaries of State's critique of it. Um, are we communicating this wrong? Why do hackers and uh, election officials disagree about what's an important vulnerability? I, I can... Do, do you want to try first? Either way. Okay, I'll, I'll do it first. So, I, security thrives in sunshine. That's really what it's all about. Um, various industries have learned this the hard way. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge. It's a difficult challenge to understand. But, but yes, we need we, we need sunshine um, on the systems. And naturally, um, you know, vendors in an industry um, often come in not understanding this. We need security. We can't show anybody anything because that would lead to insecurity. We, we need to convey the, the importance of openness in achieving security. Right here in, um, in Las Vegas, the gaming industry has learned that. They're completely open about vulnerabilities. The biohacking village over here, the medical industry has now learned this. Many industries have learned this lesson. Unfortunately, the voting industry has not learned this and basically insecurity thrives in the shadows. So I, I want Alyssa's answer, but incorporate this. You, you said the voting industry hasn't learned it. Should the major voting systems vendors be here and be mimicking the biohacking village? Uh, yes, they should be. Okay. So, I think some of them are to some extent, but they should be here contributing their equipment, talking, listening more, more openly, yes. 
I, I think the other thing that's changed from, from, last, uh, from last year is I, I think what, what people weren't thinking about on the cybersecurity side last year was the fact that the campaign that did happen was intended to undermine confidence. So the goal was to undermine confidence. And when you start talking about vulnerabilities, you have to think about how you talk about them. It's not just that there are vul vulnerabilities, oh my God, that's horrible. It's that we are looking for vulnerabilities on purpose so we can fix them. And we, I think we all know that from a, anyone who's in the, a, anyone who's worked in IT, anyone who's done anything in cyber knows that vulnerabilities are a fact of life. Uh, it's just that then the response to it, it's the fact that the next step is mitigating. It's, we should be talking about it. We should, be, we should absolutely be transparent about it. But then we need to talk about the fact that we can mitigate it. I just add to that, you know, we, we currently engage on uh, both open um, vulnerability disclosure programs as well as closed bug bounty programs for the largest organizations in the world, whether they're big financial institutions, big government organizations, um, even the Department of Defense, the Internal Revenue Service, et cetera. If these organizations, these conserved entities can embrace um, engaging with the, the global hacker community, why can't the, 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 these voting uh, machine manufacturers? I don't know why it's so challenging and difficult, but I know we were working on, on several projects kind of just on our own. Um, and as soon as they got wind of it, we, we started getting letters in the mail. And like, that's not how it should be, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, there should be way more openness. I love you know, your point of like shining sunshine on, on, on these systems. Yeah. <laughs> Like it should just be out there. We're using them, and ultimately, we need to have faith and confidence in these systems. And if if the um, cybersecurity industry doesn't have faith, how is anyone else supposed to? So, Josh, you've uh, Microsoft has been, I think, working with some of these vendors in order to get Election Guard hooked onto them. You know, is the industry changing, and are is the tech industry helping to change voting systems? Um, I think we're getting there. Um, it's, a, it's a slow process. It's a difficult process. We've gotten a good response from the vendors that, that we've talked to, but um, vendors aren't ready to say, okay, we'll just you know, disclose all of our sources and all, all of our designs yet. I would like them to. Um, I, I hope they're moving in that direction. Uh, one thing we talked, we talked a little bit about um, mandates, audits, paper, and so forth. Is it your sense, as, as you talk with jurisdictions, that they need more money? Uh, I'll say yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, we, when uh, we wrote the, uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences report uh, mm -hmm. on this, we, we, we looked a lot at the, the entire um, infrastructure. And um, not only do they need more money, they need a reliable source of money, a continual reliable source of money. These fits every 10 years of, here's some money, quick, spend it, is not a good way to build a reliable infrastructure. But, but yes, um, elections are administered at the local level in, in the U.S., in almost all states, county level, sometimes even municipal levels. Um, election uh, equipment and security is competing with potholes and roads and other, uh, other things. And... Um, it's very hard. We need a, a good, reliable stream of money to build a secure system and for infrastructure. I'd love to ask the, the panel that, that, that went first when they come back on stage, if the federal government was able to put out kind of a baseline image or you know, system um, that they built, uh, that they made accessible for you to procure, um, and even provided some funding and subsidized that development in partnership with private industry, in partnership with the security industry, like, how would you feel about that? Um, yeah, would that be a good thing, a bad thing? Do, do you think, it, you know, having this separation makes sense? Um, or should we be moving to a day where we have one reliable end-to-end -end system for voting um, that, uh, that the states can, can, you know, take advantage of? Uh, you know, I'd be really curious to get your thoughts on that. But I don't think that's going to pass Mitch McConnell's Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but... Um, so... We're here at DEF CON. You've talked positively about the voting village. What more can the hacker community do for uh, the security of elections going 2020 and beyond? I'll try. Um, you know, I, I think uh, exposing vulnerabilities is a good thing. I, I think the hacker community should be engaged. Um, we need to find better ways for 
um, the hacker community to engage directly with election officials and vendors so that we can do responsible disclosure. Right now, there just aren't mechanisms to do that, and, and we, we certainly need to be able to, to do that. But yeah, don't, don't uh, you know, stop doing what you're doing. Absolutely you know, look for vulnerabilities, and I, I would hope the manufacturers and uh, vendors will make their systems available and open so that you know, th there's a more cooperative relationship. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, you know, it's, it's hard right now because without a, a, a actual structured uh, responsible disclosure policy from these organizations, if you are doing this research, is it illegal, you know, um, or is it not? And I think that's, that's the, the, the issue. You know, I think people are um, a bit, uh, or the hackers in the room or the hackers at the conference are, are worried about even working on these systems in fear that they're going to be prosecuted. And so we need to get rid of that stigma before we can actually appropriately engage this community. And so there needs to be more policy that says this is okay. Um, before it will actually happen and be successful. And the, the DMCA exceptions don't get you there? There isn't sufficient confidence in them. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to think, well, I probably won't go to jail for doing this. You <laughs> want to have confidence. Um, so we, we talked a little bit in the last panel about the distinction between voting machines and back-end systems. We talk a lot about voting machines. We have no evidence that voting machines are actually penetrated in 2016. We do know that uh, voter databases were in Illinois and another state. Um, can you talk about that and whether the enough focus is being put on these broader systems and if the public understands that? Um, certainly the broader systems are... are, are important. My, my focus, my specialty is the casting and counting of votes. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that the registration systems aren't important and all of the other systems around elections, uh, you know, voter access in various ways. There, there are so many issues. It's a very complicated field. These are all important questions. Um, I, I worry that we'll say, well, we didn't see any uh, attacks on voting equipment in 2016, so we don't have to worry about that, that's all good. Because we know there are vulnerabilities there, and we have to give that equal importance with all the other aspects. I actually want to take a slightly different take on that, because I, I think one of the challenges is that the, the voting issue, the actual changing of votes, is something that's kind of a big headline, right? Everyone's scared that the votes were changed. And I, I think that the, the problem, again, this goes back to the, the point of what we saw in the last election cycle, if you're trying to undermine confidence, it's actually the back-end systems that are even more problematic. Because you might not know if they changed <laughs> votes, right? Um, but the back-end system, if all of a sudden on election day, your local election officer's website is flashing something that it shouldn't be flashing, um, that's not going to be building confidence in exactly the system that, that may be just fine, that may not have votes changed. Um, and, and I think um, one of the reasons we actually got involved in this space um, as a company is because we, CloudFlare, that's what we do. Um, those are the types of systems that we actually protect. Um, and it seemed to us that um, as a company that was in this space, we could do something good here. Um, and we could offer the services for free that companies get, uh, that companies pay for. Um, and so the, the notion that that is something that you can help with um, was really important to us. So you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add, you know, I think it's the voting registration systems uh, that are the, the ones that are typically connected online. And so those are the ones that we really should be most worried about. Um, and if you really think about scenarios, right, if, if, if a bad actor was able to suddenly uh, change the address of everyone that had an absentee ballot where it went to some other location and, you know, votes were not counted, it would, it would cause chaos, right? And so, you know, I, I think we have to look at end to end. There's not, if there's one hole, um, you lose total confidence in the whole system. How scared should we be? Well, quickly, oh. I'm not going to say this on stage, but if, if you want, catch me later, I'll tell you about a, an interesting uh, voter registration system issue. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> there, 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 there is a, a vulnerability that I recently discovered having to do with a, a misunderstanding of the value of randomness in um, uh, driver's licenses that uh, Washington State is suffering. It's, it's, a, it's been, been a mess. I, so, I don't want to put it on. So that's one of many like little stories that keep 
poking holes in our confidence. Um, I talked earlier about Kim Zetter's story in Motherboard about three dozen uh, system backend systems that were connected to the inter that n internet that should not have been. How scared should we be by that and all of these other little stories that could affect a county here and a county there across the country? I'd say scared. <laughs> I bet you there's way more than that. Um, uh, you know, I think, just think about how many different counties are setting these systems up and who is setting them up. It's scary. But we want you to have confidence in the system. So, <laughs> no, but very seriously, actually, on that point, I think, I think that there's a messaging point, right? I mean, I think we have to be very careful when, we, when, it, when, it just, that when the option is only scared or not scared, that's not good enough. Um, the, the, the point that the reason everyone's here and, you know, the, the question of what can hackers do, it's help, help fix it, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that it's not that everyone is scared. It's that we're thinking about it together and that we're actually fixing it together. Um, and then that helps build confidence. Um, and the more people who are involved who are trying to fix it, the more confidence there is. So uh, we're running out of time here. To close out, Alyssa, you've talked a lot about confidence, and it cuts two different ways, right? Like there's the one, you know, hey, no votes were ch there's no evidence that any votes were changed in 2016. Decent chance we'll be able to say the same in 2020. And so a lot of people will stop caring on the one hand. On the other hand, there are all of these little stories and all these vulnerabilities uh, which will make people care. And increasingly, there's a concern that the amount you care depends on whether or not your candidate got elected or not. So is there, I say as a journalist who writes about this stuff, is there a communication problem? And how should we co be, be communicating differently about this? Yeah, I do think there's a communication problem. I, I think this, this goes back to the, the point of transparency. I do think that we have to talk about the fact that our systems are vulnerable, and then that's how you build resilience to it, right? It's, it's, it, the notion has to be that people understand that vulnerability is a part of things, but again, the goal is to fix it. And I think as, as journalists, it's not, it's a system like any other. Of course there are vulnerabilities, and of course there are going to be circumstances where things could go wrong. Um, the point is that that shouldn't undermine confidence in the entire system. Um, if there are mechanisms in place to do incident response, um, if there are mechanisms in place to mitigate. And I, I think that's actually really important from a journalist perspective, because I think, unfortunately, um, some of the communication that you get is, you know, the big, the big headline is, um, is the thing that actually undermines confidence. Uh, confidence needs to be earned. Um, we should have election systems that are publicly verifiable so that any voters can check the accuracy of the counting of the votes. Uh, we, we should have uh, systems in place that are entirely open so that people can see what's going on. We shouldn't just say, oh, don't scare people. You know, I've heard that too many times. Yes, I want confidence. Undermining confidence is, is a big problem in elections, but we make it easy to undermine confidence when we have everything in shadows so that nobody can tell. We need things to be open and publicly verifiable to, to elicit confidence in elections. I think until we get there, at the very least, it's pretty confidence building. If you start actually talking about the vulnerabilities that were found uh, and posting them somewhere and then saying that we fixed the problems, I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, and I think we're always so squeamish and scared to, to like, admit that we had vulnerabilities and, and to talk about what we did to actually remediate those issues. And I think other uh, localities can learn from the vulnerabilities that exist elsewhere that are discovered. Um, and so I think transparency is absolutely key. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to hang out four minutes or so and then somehow get eight people on stage. Uh, and then be ready for all of your questions. So please prepare them. <laughs> All right, folks, it's 3 o'clock. Everyone couldn't. So. Okay, so now we have eight people up on the stage, and we've decided to do a public-private partnership and uh, alternate public and private. Um, my goal, you've heard enough from me, my goal is for you guys to ask all the questions from this point on. So what have you got? Uh, I see in the back, and we don't have a mic, so right in the center in the back. Um, and we don't have a mic, so please project, and I'll repeat questions, too. Daunting for new people in the market. How do we 
we make it easy to fix it. Right? We have this whole Windows thing where uh, people are using a version of Windows and how these can have uh, things, but even updating those systems is very hard. Just test it. everyone got that? Okay. Guy. <laughs> I, I, I can start. Yeah, some of that's pointed. Some of that is pointed a little bit at me. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have a good answer, um, uh, but um, yeah, we, it's a real problem. We put election officials in a terrible, terrible position where when we say, "Oh, there has been a vulnerability discovered in your your certified system. Here is a patch, but if you install the patch, your system will lose a certification." This is insane. Um, we need to have a better way of making what are, are called de minimis changes so that patches can be installed, small updates can be made so that we, we don't put election administrators in that terrible position. And I'll jump in and say that the group uh, that, that works on those, uh, they are today voluntary voting system guidelines and one V should be removed someday. Um, but the group that works on that, they're actually moving along that path to where it's componentized uh, certification and de minimis changes so you can actually make adjustments through the life cycle of the equipment instead of buying it 15 years ago and assuming that it's still fine today. Questions? Um, I, in the back, there. So it's a little bit more difficult uh, in application than that. Uh, we have a good example here on the stage where Colorado does almost all of their voting through the mail. And in Nevada, we do almost all of our voting in person and specifically early voting in person. And doesn't lend itself easily to a kind of one size fits all voting system. Um, but not say that, that those problems can't be overcome. Uh, but it, it's not as easy as just here's the national system that we all use and know, and that's what we use. Um, every jurisdiction, since we've been, since the elections are so de decentralized, every jurisdiction has kind of adopted a little bit of different approach to elections, and then have developed systems that complement that approach. And so it, it's it's a little bit tricky uh, of a prospect to, to have a national solution. Yeah. I, if you don't mind, I'll, um, I, I'd like to invite people to think in your mind what a streetcar looks like. In the US, you know, there's sort of this, this sense of it's got a sort of bulbous rounded front. It's, you know, there's sort of something that's a streetcar. It used to not be that way. It used to be that every city, every jurisdiction had its own streetcar. Um, it was expensive, there were safety problems, and there was a presidential commission that was formed to standardize on this. Now, it wasn't a requirement, but here is a standard, and probably in the voting systems industry, maybe did not one, but maybe several standards. And it's not just one company. Anybody can build to these standards. But once we have um, maybe you know, three or four standardized designs, um, we could actually get economies of scale that are much better than what we have today. And that might be a much, much better way to go. Uh, Jay, you sort of first posed this question. Do you have a position on it? Yeah, absolutely. I actually think all voting should be done online. Why do we still do it in person and through the mail? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I think there needs to be an easier way to vote that is deemed, uh, you know, uh, I shouldn't say 100% secure, but as secure as possibly can be, that's completely open, maybe even open source, um, that everyone can look at and everyone can vet and validate the security of that. You said it's as secure as possible. That's not... If, well, <laughs> hey, if if we're able to transact online uh, on on you know online banking and what? Hey, hands up for online voting. Hands up for online voting. Uh, I got. Okay. I got a <laughs> See, I mean, they told me to be controversial up here. So. <laughs> I, I think there's a certain level of risk that people are willing to to accept for online transactions, 
Uh, I don't know what that number is, but I don't think the public's willing to accept that level for voting at this point. Here, here, here's the, the critical difference. Right now, if you shop online and you get the wrong thing, you can tell. If your bank account is double billed, you can tell and you can fix it. You can fix these things. If you vote online and your vote's changed, you won't even know. Why, why, why With, can't we build this? Well, we, we, we can, actually. I, I, I can. I, Yes, we can do that, um, but we're not there yet. And there are many other online threats. We, we can build a system that mitigates some of these threats, but there are some online threats that we just don't have solutions to, the first of which is client malware. What if you're voting on, fr from home on a compromised device that makes everything look great and, and you can tell? We, we can make it so that you can check elsewhere, but most voters won't. And that's one of the problems. Targeted denial of service is another problem. There are numerous problems that we just don't have good solutions to. It's just premature to, to go to voting online. Audience questions? Uh, one up front here. Hi. Um, so as many of you might be aware, uh, presidential primaries in a bunch of different states are actually run by the state parties uh, instead of the state, sometimes in collaboration. Uh, sometimes very much not. Um, I'm curious, what do you perceive, if any, are the different vulnerabilities to that? I can imagine there are quite a few. But um, also, do you have any comment on the fact that places like Nevada and Iowa are engaging in virtual caucuses? Um, some over the phone, I think the other online. Sure, I'll, I'll take that. So uh, the Nevada Democratic Presidential uh, caucus, which will take place on February 22nd uh, next year, um, will include what they're calling a telecaucus or, or, or a virtual caucus. Um, matter of fact, I met with the state party officials earlier this week on Tuesday to, to talk about this issue. We, the state election, the state and local election officials have nothing to do with the party-run caucuses. It's uh, their private organization running their own nominating process and, and we don't provide any support uh, to that uh, process at all. I mean, we'll, we'll help them if they need, but it's not an official uh, election. Um, I don't, I wouldn't advocate for voting over telephone um, right now. Um, and, but they, you know, they have, they have gone the route of, of being, trying to be as inclusive as possible uh, sometimes security and accessibility uh, are at odds, maybe, maybe all the time. There are lots of times they're at odds with each other. So trying to find that balance and they've kind of come down, I, I was not involved in those decisions, but come down on the side of the, the, the accessibility component and I think sacrificing some, some of the security there. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, uh, right in the front over there. Is a question was about how to mitigate influence campaigns. Yes, so what we have, uh, if you go to our votesure.sos.ca.gov, that is our one-stop website regarding election information. We also do a lot of campaigns, not just the digital but printed campaigns. Um, so, and we have a group of people, a team of people that is very specific on misinformation. We have, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a team of individuals that monitor uh, the internet and then also uh, basically um, call the, 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 the social media if there's, we found stuff and let them decide whether they want to take it down or not. So it's, it, that, that our, um, our election cybersecurity team is responsible for that. Effective communication is a key and also information sharing with our DHS partners, with our uh, state and other local governments. Also between our state, like Colorado, California, we always look at each other, we look at what they've done and not reinvent the wheel. So it's information sharing is super important. Did that answer? If you need more information, I can take it off the line. Vote sure, V O T E S U R E, that SOS, that CA, that gov. 
And, and I'll add on that from the, the CISA side. So obviously that was one of the prongs uh, that we saw in, in 2016 and we wanted to, as we talked about again, some of the uh, services that we provide both, uh, both on the uh, proactive side and the incident uh, response side, we have a whole separate uh, looking at the information operations. Uh, so uh, you may have seen in the lead up to, to DEF CON and Black Hat, uh, we've put out, and again, supporting our state and local jurisdictions to help them uh, as they uh, put out information on countering foreign influence, uh, a campaign called the war on pineapple, right? So we're using a non-divisive, uh, at least what we think, do you like pineapple on your pizza, right? <laughs> and, and, and start to, again, uh, start that conversation to say, hey, this is how, again, adversaries are, are uh, sowing that type of discontent. These are the things that you can do about it. And again, using, again, our state and local officials, whether they're doing it on their own or, again, using the, some of the material that we have out there to get that information out. Then separately, again, on election day, I think we talked about the election day situation room, right, uh, that we run, again, in partnership with the EIISAC and, and again, with, uh, you know, the 50 states, the uh, st state and local jurisdictions. If we're seeing items, again, on the inf uh, information uh, operations, whether it's a Twitter or a Facebook post, uh, we had, you know, at, at the last campaign, uh, those social media companies uh, on side by side with us. So, again, that state could bring that up uh, in, in the uh, situation room and, and like that, uh, again, they're getting attention both from those social media uh, companies at that. So I, I won't do a pineapple pizza poll, but you're all welcome to tweet your preferences to uh, all of the CISA Twitter accounts. <laughs> uh, got a question right there in the center. Uh, great question, and so I'll, I'll so that number one, um, that is what the uh, we're doing with the. Uh uh, both the multi-state ISAC and the ele elections infrastructure ISAC, right? So again, that is your public-private partnership uh, that's funded through DHS CISA, but again, working with, again, our industry partners, all our state and local partners, uh, whether that's information sharing and making sure these, uh, uh, again, the, the services that we have to provide are out there. Um, I'll also uh, talk about, um, separately, uh, we have what we call, when, when we look at critical infrastructure, we have, uh, and again, as I talked about earlier, 16, that we consider critical infrastructure. The way uh, we work uh, with these uh, communities are, are through what we call government coordinating councils and sector coordinating councils, right? So uh, I always think of them as a pseudo board of advisors um, looking at best practices. So that is set, so I can tell you the government coordinating council has 27 folks on it, 24 of those are from state and local jurisdictions, and then the sector coordinating councils are industry partners, right? And again, they're meeting anywhere from bi-weekly to weekly, obviously the NAS, the NAS said all our partners are there. So when there's best practices out there, right, I think there's, there's goals that the Government Coordinating Council has said they want for 2020, including, you know, full paperless, you know, balloting, but, or uh, by then, I mean, those are, you know, some of the entities that at least on the CISA side, we're supporting our state and local partners with. Questions? Uh, in the front right there. I understand that correctly, but that's what I, that's like the kind of feeling that I got 
that you guys were talking. Like, what's the right approach to talk to these voting system vendors? Like, hey, like you have a corporate responsibility as you know a vendor in this part of democracy to do like be more open about voting disclosures. Everyone's still hearing all these questions, right? Okay. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for asking real questions and being pretty succinct about it. Uh, so I can take your question in reverse order. Uh, so first of all, I think that there needs to be, um, when we're procuring these systems and we have these manufacturers building them for us, I think the onus is really on them to, to patch these security issues as part of their contract in perpetuity. Like, if there is a vulnerability that exists, they sh there shouldn't be a question of, okay, who's going to pay for the fix? Like, they created the problem, they need to fix it. Um, uh, so to your, to your first question about, you know, how do you, how do you kind of do bug bounty on systems that are this sensitive? You know, you don't want to necessarily expose them to Russian, uh, you know, actors because if they find the issues and we don't and they don't disclose them, like, that can be a problem. So I think there are definitely ways of doing this. I mean, it's something that's kind of what we, the genesis of our company at Synac, we, we, we kind of, I don't mean this to be like a marketing uh, pitch, but, um, you know, we, we, we can do this in a, highly controlled manner where we vet all the resources. They can be U.S. citizens only. They can work all from our infrastructure. We kind of can log and audit and monitor everything that they're doing, um, but still get the benefit of more of that crowdsourced type of approach. Um, and so I think, you know, there, there are definitely ways of, of doing this in a highly controlled and trusted environment. Um, and then maybe you take this in phases and eventually it becomes more open and there is an open vulnerability disclosure program. Um, but scope is very complex because it's so broad, right? You were talking about, um, I mean, we talked about all the different disparate systems that are out there and the different types of voting systems that are out there. So I think it's a huge challenge, uh, but would require a lot of uh, a lot of partnership, you know, kind of unilaterally across almost every single state. Yeah. Um, so I spent some time in the biohacking village yesterday, as did some of the other kind of election official type people that are here uh, at the conference. You know, we spoke to so some of the folks who've been around the village uh, since its inception, and I think it actually might be a really useful model. Okay, because um, I, I believe that as it started, you had uh, Jay, you know, who hacked his own insulin pump, right, and tried to report it to the manufacturer and got shut down. Uh, they would not talk. Um, and now, today, you know, you've got the manufacturers bringing their stuff in. And they're, and they're putting it in there and they're working with the security researchers to find those issues so they can then address them. I think, and several of us that were on that tour, um, that's actually a really useful model because today it's a pretty antagonistic kind of arm's length relationship, voting machine vendors in the security community, and it needs to change. And I think learning from some models that have been adopted in other industries I think would serve as well. Questions? Um, got one there. Thank you guys for the talk. Um, with the appointment of the new election starting to get under the DNI, is there any indication of whether or not they're going to get forward any of the security researchers or cybersecurity policy as a paramount part of that? And then, second part, do you think any of that will trickle down from the intelligence community to the state? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah. I, I can't really speak to what DNI is going to do there. Uh, I, what I will say, again, it's, it, it is a whole of government effort, which you've heard me say. So uh, obviously CISA has its part uh, working with our state and local election partners and, and industry, but obviously the intelligence community, the IC, uh, the DOD, uh, again, the, the whole part of the federal government here to support um, our state and local partners. And this is just a chunk of it, but a lot of what the election ISAC is sending out through DHS comes from the intelligence community, right? That's absolutely right. So, and again, a pitch. So the EI ISAC uh, sits on the, our, our, our cyber center floor. So again, that same information that's being shared with our intelligence agencies that are there sitting on the floor as well. So the information shared and then filtered out again through the EI ISAC. So sometimes, again, you know, there's so much coming in and, and make it more specific so the election uh, officials can uh, use that. Questions? One right there. Yeah, the comments you made uh, just before about uh, the systems being maintained in perpetuity seem somewhat naive to me. First of all, because the, uh, the vendors are going to have to monetize the maintenance of, of these products. They will, only be, they will only be patchable or updatable if they're already online to a central system, which means they can be compromised. The 
So even if the vendors are producing patches, they're still going to have to be uh, patched by the, uh, the organization's own IT people. And that means that those IT people will also have to be trained. Then the, the, the second part of that is, how, what do they do in terms of the longevity of the vendors in the first place? Yeah, what if the voting machine companies go out of business and it got five more years? That's a real risk. I mean, I think it's the a consensus perfect. seems to be yes. <laughs> I think it's a perfect example of why maybe there should be, you know, some uh, kind of what you were saying before, you know, just a few standards that, that everyone should mm -hmm. follow. Other questions? No. Oh, oh. One thought on that, actually. Uh, you know, I, I think we often talk, talk in, um, if you think about procurement of, of IT, you think about life cycles. And there's no reason that voting equipment shouldn't have the same thing. And I think that's really the point. Um, there, it's not that you have it into perpetuity. It's that you have a life cycle for it. Um, that is a, it's part of the contract. Um, so that's not my expertise at all, but that's just my, <laughs> my two cents. Questions? Okay, one right there. Oh. Alex, and, and can you give us like the, the 30 second uh, Albert sensor? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> devices, devices that are deployed on networks to actually provide signaling back to headquarters for assimilation, aggregation, and then further analysis so they can warn other people. So if they see something bad happen over here in some state that has an Albert sensor, they can actually inform everyone else to be aware of the same, uh, you know, have their eyebrows up and all that sort of thing. Um, so I think Albert devices are a useful uh, uh, thing for collecting information about attack patterns, attack sources and that sort of thing. Um, Alberts don't do anything other than give you some situational awareness on things you may be seeing. It's really valuable in terms of information sharing and situational awareness. It's not the answer. I mean, you need to have defense in depth. There need to be a lot of other things in play in addition to Albert sensors. Do, I'm, not, I'm not meaning whatsoever to diminish the value of knowing what other, you know, potential targets are seeing to pr equip yourself better, but it's not the only answer. Alex, you're nodding at that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, can I quickly? This is why for me it, it's so important to have external verifiability. This is why I keep talking about public verifiability, black box verifiability, sometimes it's called end-to-end -end verifiability. But the idea is that you should be able to check the results of an election, be confident of the outcome without having to trust that the equipment is good. You can do it black box, you don't worry about the equipment, you can still check the election. Well, and, and I'll just, you know, wrap that up with, with uh, of course, and as we talked about, la layers of security, right? And it's just, it's, it's just one of the resources, the Albert sensors, uh, that we deploy out there to the state and local partners to support them, right? So if th that's one, right, our, our vulnerability scanning is the other, the, the red team pen testing. So, uh, and we can go on and on in, in about even working with industry and what they bring. So I think it, it is one sense, but it's a layered defense. And, and if there is something that can be found, let us know. And then, you know, we'll take a look at that. Questions? One right there. So the question is about an insider threat, basically, right? If, yeah. You can, we can detect that yeah. too. You can detect that too. Any yes, any tampering whatsoever with an election can be detected. Insider tampering, outsider tampering, any kind of tampering is detectable. There, well, there is technology that is that will make this detectable. We're building that technology out now and sharing it with vendors, hoping to get them to adopt this. 
the, yes, yes. It's not, it, it doesn't exist in the currently deployed technology. We have to get administrators to use it um, and, and get it out there. So but if, if, it, if it's in some places but not others, there's going to be a lot of pressure on those places that are not using it to do it. Anyone in government want to talk about this insider threat corrupt election administrator question? I mean, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll talk about it from what we're doing from the state of Nevada perspective. Um, it absolutely is a threat, the insider threat. Um, so in addition, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the nation state actor and what the nation state can do. Uh, but we're just as concerned about the insider threat. Uh, I'm, I'm like the least techie person probably in this whole room. Um, so I don't want to be preaching to you all about how, how this works, but you know, we, we've kind of used the, the, um, the uh, standard of like, you know, least, uh, lowest level accessibility, uh, you know, and so we started working on our voter registration database where there's like user access levels where not everyone has the same levels. You only have access to what you need for your job and then tiering that up. Um, so that we, yeah, we can mitigate some of the risks that come, come with the insider threats. Um, um, but it's just one more thing that, that uh, election officials need to be concerned about. So time for probably one more, maybe two. Uh, there's one actually, right there. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, actually, before we take a question, I'd like to take this opportunity to plug our, 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 I know that I'm, I'm excited that everybody's here inter interested about election, but if you want to do your civic duty, help, the state, okay? We have a lot of uh, IT and security open positions, and we suggest, you, you, you know, you don't have to go with pay, go work for the state. Um, that will help, help us a lot, because right now we have positions and we have funding, but if we don't have you, um, in our in the state government, then we, we we can't do much. So that's my plug. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, last question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So um, the question was, the, the Kim Zetter's mother board, board story uh, found three dozen instances of wireless connections that shouldn't have been there. Um, how can you maintain confidence if those have been online for three years despite everything DHS has done? Is that fair? Okay. Well, and I think, you know, I, I might have answered that earlier on the first uh, panel there, but you know, as I've said again, since we started this in uh, 2017, you've seen the steps that have, have been taken, right? Working with our state and local jurisdictions uh, across both cyber and physical services. So, but the work is not done. <laughs> I think, and, and again, those stories and these vulnerabilities, and again, the number of election officials that are here uh, this year, and I'm sure will grow next year, and everything you've heard on this panel, uh, it's just going to grow and will be stronger, again, as an election community for that. So I, I think, you know, in summary, w without, uh, you know, running through everything that we talked about over these last 90 minutes, uh, we're definitely further along than we were, and there's more work to be done, and, and that's why we're here. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. All right, all right. Last question in the back.
Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful questions.